that being said, I will introduce uh, our first speaker of the day. Let me just get this to open. Okay, so I'm honored uh, to introduce Professor Francesca Rosberg, uh, who I just had a change of a few mails and just met right now. <laughs> uh, um, welcome. Uh, and um, Professor Rosberg is quite uh, well known uh, in, the, in the field of the history of astrology. Um, she has specialized, specializes in um, the, one, the more ancient Virtan uh, uh, aspects of, of, the, of the history. So she's an Assyriologist uh, focusing on the history of science, uh, so in Babylonian astronomy and astrology. Um, her books are well known. Um, the one perhaps more no that marked uh, historiography is Babylonian horoscopes. Um, but more recently, she has also published um, The Path of the Moon, Babylonian Celestial Divination and its Legacy, uh, Before Nature, Cuneiform Knowledge and the History of Science, and uh, at the latest one with co-edited uh, co with Alan Bowen, Hellenistic Astronomy, the Science its, and its Context. So... Welcome, uh, Professor, uh, and please, you may have. Thank you so much, Luis, and it is really such an honor and a pleasure to be with everyone today, and uh, thank you so much for including me in the Astra Project um, and this workshop uh, hosted by your university, Lisbon, and the Warburg Institute, which I miss dearly. Um, So I just thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. To quote Noel Swerdlow, at the time of Copernicus and until sometime in the 17th century, to the best of my knowledge, there was no one concerned with astronomy who was not also concerned with astrology. This observation is not only true of the early modern period, but of antiquity as well, from Babylonian and Egyptian antiquity into the Greco-Roman and medieval worlds. The closely interconnected astronomical sciences, therefore, comprising both the technical methods of astronomy and the interpretive ones of astrology, were in significant ways continuous from Babylonian antiquity to the Renaissance. How should historians navigate something as vast as the history of astrology. Those of us who devote research to astrological texts in specific contexts feel dismay at how this research has been and still largely is translated into broader historiographies of science. I don't want to sound unduly critical And in fact, I believe there has been a sea change within the wider history of science community regarding the place of astrology in history, in that history. But historiography flows from terminology. So it seems to me that a number of points can be made on both scores. In this short discussion, I will address terminology first and then historiography. Historiography flows from the denotation and connotation of key terms. The terminology we employ establishes how we delineate and define science in the pre-modern world. Hopefully our terminology can work as holistically as the sources permit. Differences notwithstanding, astronomy and astrology do not represent two opposing or competing systems as they came to do much later. I do not address here the distinction posed by the Greek usages of astronomia and astrologia, which have no counterparts in Babylonia or Egypt. At the risk of speaking too generally, ancient astronomical and astrological texts and practices were closely interconnected parts of one complex system that synthesized knowledge of the heavens using that specialized knowledge for a variety of purposes. In Babylonia, the synthesis was between mathematical and or schematic prediction of celestial phenomena and practices of prognostication from the phenomena for human society or individuals. A similar synthesis 
in the Greek and Greco-Egyptian tradition had various degrees of impact on other strains of Greek thought not found in Babylonia, such as physics, cosmology, and philosophy, as well as on the horoscopic practices that were the legacy of Babylonia. How then should we call this knowledge? I don't think there has yet been a satisfactory or satisfying terminology. Until rather recently, we made do with the inherited terms astronomy and astrology. Repeatedly qualifying or explaining away the assumed separation those terms implied. Today, the rubric astral science is used to cover both astronomy and astrology in the pre-modern Middle East and Mediterranean. My question today is, does the term astral, which simply means of the stars, do sufficient work to capture the scientific nature of all the disciplines included under that rubric? What about the descriptor astronomical as the covering rubric to characterize the knowledge of the heavenly phenomena as a science in all its guises throughout the regions and periods of interest? Astronomical means related to the discipline um, or science of astronomy instead of related to the stars and so refers more directly to the scientific nature of the knowledge and ideas in question. Although the first contra argument would be that astral sciences takes care of that problem. Another objection to the term astronomical sciences to apply as well to astrology might be that this subsumes astrology under astronomy and using astronomical as the rubric for all of these forms of knowledge and practice erases what important differences there are among them. True enough, Astral sciences is meant to encompass all the same kinds of knowledge and practice under a single term and combining it with science underscores the scientific status of these forms in their own contexts. However, when it comes to questions about the transmission of the astral sciences from the ancient Middle East to the Western Mediterranean, much of what was transmitted were the ideas developed in celestial divination horoscopy, and the quantitative methods of astronomy. Are we to speak of astral ideas uh, and astral methods, or are we right back to astronomical or astrological ideas or methods and back to the false separations those terms convey? It would be useful to have a term that can encompass numerical parameters as well as non-mathematical ideas such as the all important idea of the very connection between human beings and the heavens. These are different sorts of ideas, but both arguably belong to the category of astronomical ideas. Because the adjective astronomical not only refers to the object of inquiry, namely the phenomena of the heavens, but also the nature of the contents of these sources, the term serves well in referring to all the scientific disciplines related to knowledge of heavenly phenomena. This includes celestial divination, descriptive or predictive astronomy, uh, whether schematic or mathematical, and genetheological astrology in the forms of nativity omens or horoscopes, and including literary horoscopes and horoscopic diagrams. Thus, I think, but really I put the question to you, that the terms astronomical science, astronomical ideas, astronomical methods, and astronomical knowledge offer a consistent terminology to refer to the entire range of predictive and descriptive astronomy, celestial divination, and horoscopic astrology in a way that astral science, astral methods, astral knowledge, and ideas cannot. Perhaps there is no real need for such terminological consistency but it would put an end to the quagmire the term astrology has faced and still sometimes faces in the historiography of science. Turning to the historiographical question, one often hears the word demarcation tossed around 
implying that astrology is to be demarcated from other astronomical sciences because of its ontological or metaphysical commitments. I maintain that delineating and defining science in the pre-modern context is, is not relevant to Karl Popper's famed demarcation project. Demarcations can be useful in terms of text types and context of use, but as is clear in a recent volume of papers from 2013 uh, by Piliucci and Boudry, or Baudry, the persistent issue for demarcation in the history of science has settled on how to decide on the lines separating science from pseudoscience. But as Popper said in his 1935 Logic of Scientific Discovery, quote, the problem of finding a criterion which would enable us to distinguish between the empirical sciences on the one hand and mathematics and logic as well as metaphysical systems on the other I call the problem of demarcation, end quote. Pseudoscience per se was not the issue, but demarcation addressed a broader question in the theory of knowledge at its most fundamental level. In this way, Popper challenged the Vienna Circle positivists' commitment to induction as a method of generating reliable knowledge from observation. Before the goal of demarcation settled on the project of distinguishing science from pseudoscience, which term does not occur anywhere in the text of the logic of scientific discovery, all the non-sciences were targeted, including metaphysics and many of the ideologies of Popper's day, famously psychoanalysis and Marxism. Such questions of epistemology and meaning according to the positivists, only empirical statements were granted meaning, metaphysical statements not, have little to no bearing on our present historical investigations of, of astronomy and ancient, astro uh, uh, ancient astrology. The mode in which cuneiform scribes sought meaning in phenomena was distinct from natural science altogether. And so to subject the cuneiform divinatory sciences or astrology to the criteria for demarcation a la Popper is both ahistorical and philosophically pointless. Nevertheless, although the science pseudoscience demarcation is anachronistic in the discussion of Babylonian astrology or celestial divination, the question persists. Our contemporary demarcation discourse is not relevant to our historical investigations because the aim is to make the distinctions that define their aim, the demarcationist's aim, is to make the distinctions that define science against its imitations. As Piliucci said, to, dis to establish a baseline definition that, quote, we can all agree on about science, unquote. He says, quote, science attempts to gain an empirically based theoretical understanding of the world so that a scientific theory has to have both empirical support and internal coherence and logic, unquote. He tempered his remark on empiricism, however, pointing out that it is the empirical theoretical plane whose relationship is unstable and historical context is one of the main destabilizers. What, quote, we can all agree on about science, unquote, in history is not, in my view, reducible to a convenient or formulaic definition on the model of modern science such that its deliberate imitations become an issue. Demarcation became a matter of science versus pseudoscience only after the middle of the 19th century when the term science took on its more or less familiar sense and the term pseudoscience was first used. In historical contexts prior to this and extending into the ancient world of cuneiform texts, Attributing the notion of a pseudoscience to such a world is what Nick Jardine would call vicious anachronism. Another way in which the philosophy of science has taken astrology and other superseded sciences from their central place in the history of science was by means of the argument known as the pessimistic meta-induction. This asserts that the sciences of the past were largely wrong 
and based on insufficient knowledge and thus deficient in some way when compared against more recent sciences. This is profoundly ahistorical. I would even say anti-historical. Despite the grossly ahistorical measurement of pre-modern achievements by modern standards, the purpose of the pessimistic meta-induction was not actually to impugn the history of science, but to claim that if the history of science shows us the error of our ways, we can suspect that our current scientific theories will also prove false in time. In other words, the goal was to challenge scientific realism. The idea, however, turned the history of science into a graveyard of dead scientific theories and abandoned theoretical posits, so said Moti Mizrahi, which could hardly be productive for something like the history of astrology. The pessimistic induction engaged in a direct comparison of historical evidence against modern and erased the differences between them that relate to the representational goals of science. It thus validated the writing of the history of science retrospectively and emphasized continuities. Indeed, the history of science does not have to be viewed as a graveyard of methods, ideas, and theoretical posits, even if we are keen to see the connective tissue of scientific methods and ideas over time. The history of science has more to offer than comparisons to modern science or evidence for answering the question of whether science itself displays a continuous progressive development over time. Canguillem put it succinctly when he said, quote, history is not an inverted image of scientific progress. Methodologically in part, Important cont uh, continuities may be found, but room must also be made for the parts that do not map onto the expected parameters of science from a modern perspective. Some of those parts lie in the ontologies implied in primary sources. For a science that was once as valid and central to scientific communities as astrology was, what makes it of interest to the history of science is not whether its principal theoretical posit, stellar influence, was wrong or right. Stellar influence was itself indication of a particular world construction, originating in the Greek and Greco-Roman world, traceable in some sense to Babylonian medicine and magic. The significance to the history of science is found precisely in the things astrological sources reflect of the world conceived of by its practitioners. To quote Erica Reiner, stars function in a dual role in relation to man. They exert a direct influence and serve as mediators between man and God. Directly through astral irradiation, they transform ordinary substances into potent ones that will be effective in magic, medicine, or ritual as materia medica amulets or cultic appurtenances. The astral irradiation Reiner referred to seems to connote something in direct line with the later notion of stellar influence. And by the way, this is an appropriate use of the word astral in my view. The idea may well have had a genetic relationship to the Babylonian system. However, by the time the notion was formalized, in Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos, admittedly many, many centuries later, the influence or power, dunamis, of the stars as causes by virtue of the movement of planetary rays, actines, through the ether of the celestial spheres was something of an entirely different order from what is reflected in cuneiform medical and magical texts, not to mention uh, celestial divination. These are the nuances, not necessarily of development in the sense of progress, but of the variable relationships between systems of knowledge and the worlds to which they refer. This, to my mind, is where science is located. I'm sorry to raise only questions and offer little in the way of answers. Terminology clearly has a determinative effect on our very conception of the nature of pre-modern sciences and how we approach and write their histories. 
perhaps there is no one consistent term or set of terms to adequately convey the ancient reality of astronomy and astrology as component parts of one system. Perhaps then we have to live with astral science for a while, even though I wish there were something better. Thank you so much. I hope I Thank didn't you. overrun my time. No, I don't think so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm sure it will generate a lot of discussion by the end when we reach that phase. Thank you.